All right. Looks like everybody is out of the waiting room or nearly out of the waiting room. So welcome everyone to the second virtual um, Portland Clean Energy Fund um, committee grant committee meeting. I think Sam is going to uh, open today. Um, at, we're going to go around and do some introductions and then um, how we have a special guest, uh, Commissioner Hardesty is with us, who's going to say a few words and um, talk with the committee members. Sam? Yep. So I think what I want to start with is just our regular introductions. And so let's start with the intro. What I expect is let's start the introductions with um, introductions of uh, committee members as well as staff and then um, folks on the line. And then we'll turn it to Commissioner Hardesty to share a little bit. And, and I'll share as well a statement from the mayor as well as Commissioner Hardesty afterwards. So um, I think let's let's go around and do the introductions with the committee members first and, and we'll queue up the, the members of the audience as well. Start with you. Robert. And if you. So if we we can maybe I will just call, call out and you can introduce yourself. Um, Megan. Hi, uh, Megan Horsey, her uh, committee member. Robin. Hi, Robin Wang, committee member. He him. Andrea. Hi, Andrea Hamburg, committee member. She her. Faith. Good evening, everyone. I hope you are well. Faith Grand, she her committee member. Jeff. Jeff Moreland, committee member, he, him. Michael. Michael Eden Hill, committee member, he, him, has. Janice. Janice Clark, committee member. Hello, uh, she, her, they, them. Maria. Maria Sippen, committee member, she, they. Mm -hmm. Ranfis. Hi, everyone. Uh, Ranfis Giugino Viatoro, uh, committee member, he, him. All right, thank you. And before we go into staff introductions, um, I just want to, folks who are logged on to the Zoom meeting, if you can send your introduction via the chat box, then we can, staff can manage that um, from that end and then after we're done with the chat box introductions, we'll open the phone lines if anybody is on the phone. So I'll start the staff introductions. My name is Katie Lister. I'm part of the PSAS startup team. And she, her are my preferred pronouns. Sam? My name is Sam Brass. I'm part of the PSAS startup team. And he, him are my pronouns as well, or my, are my pronouns. Yeah. <laughs> James? James? Hi, everybody. Uh, James Valdez, um, also a member of the PSEF startup team and he, him pronouns. June? Hi, everyone. June Reyes. I uh, use she, her pronouns and also I'm part of the PSEF startup team. Janet? Good evening, everybody. Janet Hammer, uh, she, her pronouns and um, honored to be a member of the PSEF startup team. And June, did you want to read the introductions via the chat box? Yeah, so we have um, Greg Hart, Executive Director from Solar for All Inc. here, Suzanne Beaudry, um, Casas from PCRI. Um, we have Yasmin Ibarra from SEIU 49, Micah Meskel from Portland Audubon, Anissa Pemberton from uh, coalition of Communities of Color as a piece of coalition coordinator, Gail Palmer from East Portland Action Plan and the Centennial Community Association, Tim Miller, Executive Director of PECI, Teresa Gaddy, Program Manager at EcoTrust, Jesse Hyatt from the NAACP slash the ACC, I think the Black African American Chamber of Commerce, um, David Radke from a business rep and organizer with IBE. W Local 48, an Electrical Workers Union of the Greater Portland Area. We have Chris Robertson, Nicole Spencer, Michael Human, Havara Shalom, and from Havara Shalom and Metropolitan Alliance, Daniela Chansey from Malaita Northwest, Sarah Heineck from Wood Eco District, Jenny Hall from Energy Trust of Oregon, Peter Tafalvi with Performance Installation, doing business as 
Home Rx and Brian Garcia from Lloyd Eco District. Shall we go ahead and I'll go ahead and it, unmute folks on the phone. Oh, sorry, Sam. It, it, and Maggie and Maggie Johnson from Cascadia Behavioral Health. Yes. All right, I'm going to go ahead and unmute folks who are joining us by phone. If you can introduce yourselves. Do we have someone with the last four digits of 4813? I don't know what my phone shows up as, but this is Angela Crowley Cook with OCS. Great. Is there anyone else on the phone who'd like to introduce themselves? Yeah, this is I'm John. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, John. Oh, I'm John Moore, and I'm a participant for Frog Ferry. Thanks, John. Uh, Daniel Cloyd, Facility Asset Manager for College Housing Northwest. Angela Prividelli, BPS Staff. Great, I think that's everyone. Okay. All right. Well, just a- Sam, back at you. <laughs> Thank you. I, I guess I just wanted to, before we kick off, I want to just remind folks, and Katie, I think you're, you're probably going to do this again, but I want to remind folks that we do have captioning on for this meeting. Um, so if you want to see the captioning, just uh, and you're viewing the, the meeting via uh, your computer, you just need to click close caption and show subtitles so you can see our captioning. And with that, I'd like to welcome our astounded um, Commissioner Joanne Hardesty to share a few comments with you all, um, and I'll share a few comments afterwards. So, Commissioner Hardesty, you have the floor. Ah, thank you so much. Good evening. Um, I hope everybody is safe. Um, I hope you are uh, keeping your social distance uh, and that you are thinking about what's possible once we get to the other side of this crisis. I think it's safe to say that we have never ever in my lifetime and most people's lifetime seen the kind of pandemic that we are experiencing. Um, and it requires us to be uh, so much more visionary than we ever thought we could be uh, as a city. Um, I will tell you that uh, right after we started seeing the significance of the economic impact, as you can imagine, there were a lot of recommendations about uh, uh, suspending uh, Portland Clean Energy Fund, uh, redeploying money and funds uh, for other immediate needs. Um, and I wanted to come to you this evening to say to you that the Portland City Council is steadfast in the mission of the Portland Clean Energy Fund. Uh, the only thing that we have done is to allow for a slowdown of the collection of uh, the taxes that will be due uh, uh, coming up in this near uh, future. Uh, but there is no uh, proposal to stop, reform, change, uh, divert uh, PCEF dollars from its mission. I and my city council colleagues are committed uh, to both the spirit, the vision, and the expectations of the Portland Clean Energy Grants which is that they will be led by frontline communities, black, indigenous, other people of color, and they will be the decision makers about how we move forward. Of course, the pandemic changes the universe significantly, but it doesn't change our mission. And in fact, it makes the Portland Clean Energy Fund even more necessary, even more vital to the economic recovery uh, that we will need to be a part of. And so I just wanted to come tonight and say, we're in this together. We are committed uh, to the values and the vision of the Portland Clean Energy Fund. Um, and uh, there is nothing that I would support that would weaken, that would divert, that would mitigate 
uh, the vision, the values behind the Portland Clean Energy Fund. And I know the mayor feels as strongly as I do. He didn't start there, but he's there now. Uh, and uh, there are many others who feel as passionately as I do. Uh, we, will, uh, we will survive the pandemic, and I believe we will be a more equitable community because of the pandemic and what we do to come out of it to rebuild our communities. So I will stop there, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that people may have. Nothing? You got nothing? <laughs> <laughs> For the committee members, if you can recall from last time, the raise hand if you want it function, if you wanted to make a comment or ask a question. Maybe you just start. Oh, Faith? Uh, I just wanted to thank you, Commissioner Hardesty, and also the, the rest of the uh, commissioners and city council for um, standing behind PSEP and protecting those dollars. I, of course, do have questions. Um, just the question, perhaps I think maybe Sam will answer, but I'm going to give you the floor to answer is what does it mean that um, the PSEP dollars, I, there's a delay uh, in collecting those taxes, I assume, or I, I gathered from your comments. What, what does that look like for the first deployment of PSEP dollars timeline? Thank you for that question. It will have absolutely no impact on the first deployment of dollars. Uh, we are on the exact same timeline, which is what I'm so excited about. If we are, are able to meet, with, which is a very ambitious timeline, even before the coronavirus, right? If we're able to meet that timeline, I think the timing will be perfect uh, to be able to start deploying exactly uh, the same timeline, the same resources. The only difference is the delay allows businesses who may be impacted. But let me just say, remind folks that we're talking billion dollar industries, right? So if you think about Walmart and Kmart and Target and all those folks, they are making out like champs at the moment because people are so uh, stationary and they can't, they, they're limited where they can travel. So the only people who pay this tax are, they have to have $1 billion national sales and a half million dollar sales in the city of Portland. Um, if they don't meet both of those criteria, they will not be impacted by the economic downturn of the coronavirus. Ramses? Uh, I just wanted to express uh, and thank the commissioner for um, joining us and expressing that message and you know, I look forward to um, you know, future communication from, from the committee, um, from city council on this. So, so, so thank you again for being there and uh, I don't have any additional questions, but I think I just wanted to um, echo back what I heard in terms of like the importance of PSEF and how it'll play an important role, uh, especially as we you know, as we transition from hopefully in the near future, from uh, moving away from staying at home to rebuilding and hope PSEF can be um, that key economic engine to revitalize the economy. So I think we'll continue to try to work and press forward on, on that vision. So thank you for, the, for, for those express statements. You're very welcome. Um, but let me also say that uh, we are depending on you uh, to be the critical eye, uh, you have a huge responsibility uh, to review applications that will come from a variety of different communities and will read a lot of different ways, right? Um, most traditional uh, funding mechanisms are based on a very uh, narrow set of assessments, right? The reason each of you are part of the grant committee is because you bring a worldview that is different than the traditional systems would be, right? So you would read an application based on your lived experience differently than someone who was reading an application based on a, uh, a mathematical formula that dictated uh, percentages about whether or not it would be successful. 
Does that make sense? Uh, and in addition to that, um, I know I will be uh, following this process very closely. Sam can tell you, I meet regularly. Um, I have a staff that meets with Sam as well uh, because I wanna make sure that this is a model. Um, I'm not interested in rebuilding an unequitable community uh, when this crisis is over. I am looking forward to building a community that centers frontline communities and actually make sure that people with the least access and least resources are the ones who benefit from our investments. Uh, I believe that other folks will have access to a whole bunch of resources, but the folks that you're going to be centering are folks who this is going to be their opportunity to create a green future. And I just want to end with how clean the air is when there are almost no cars on the road and we are not using a whole, we're not putting a whole lot of poisons in the air. It's a wonderful to be able to walk outside right now, right? Uh, so we have to figure out how we can have clean air and transportation as we move into this new feature. Uh, so thank you. I, I get excited about this, which is why I could talk a lot, but I really want to make sure that I answer any questions that you have and that you know that you have an open door at City Hall to actually really talk about how we move this vision forward. Great. Thank you, Commissioner Hardy. See, really appreciate it. Thank My you. Pleasure. So with that, with, with that, I would like to just share the statement that was drafted both with Commissioner Hardesty as well as the mayor. Um, and then we'll kick off into the meeting, which I know we're running back. So I'm gonna just move through this. Um, we wanna thank you all for the hard work you're doing, particularly in these uncertain times. As you all continue your work on the Portland Clean Energy Fund, you are no doubt thinking about your role in the role of PCEF in the public health and the economic crisis we're currently facing. Your work is important now more than ever. PSEF was designed to address the same underlying inequalities that are exacerbated by the current crisis and will play a critical role in supporting community response and economic recovery in an equitable, climate-friendly way. So it is critical that you continue to implement the Portland Clean Energy Fund as designed. The climate crisis exists in parallel with the current COVID crisis, not apart from it. With that said, we recognize you all may be concerned about the immediate needs of folks we intend to help through the first set of PSEF investments. Knowing, know that the city is working hard to support those most in need across our community. The city expects to directly receive at least 100 million through the Federal CARES Act and will look to these resources to support our community. It is also important to note that the CARES Act is focused on response during these three months of the health crisis while we are social distancing. It does not address the reopening or recovery periods. And for this reason, amongst many others, PSEF will be instrumental not only in providing critical resources during the recovery, but also in building a community, in building community resilience over the long term and demonstrating a new model for making climate investments centered on equity. So we thank you all. We want you all to know that you have the full support of both of our offices in moving PCEF's important work forward. And the city council looks forward to receiving your funding recommendations later this year. We also want you to know that staff consistently praises committee and the compassion you all bring to the work. Thank you all for doing what you're doing. So that's that. And so with that, I think uh, I don't need to say any more. Um, and maybe the one flag I'll make is that we talked about scheduling you all for more meetings. And so we're going to follow up with a doodle poll after this so that we can make up some ground as we shorten our meetings. So just know that you'll, you'll be expecting a doodle poll here in the coming days so that we can we can find some more meeting times. So, I'm Katie, just going to gonna check out then. Thank you so much, Sam. Thank you to the committee. Uh, and again, we are here to help you uh, do the best job you can do. Have a great evening. Thanks for the invite. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Well, the, we, um, the first thing that we wanted to go over, and Sam already did mention this, but we do have um, closed captioning available in, in this meeting. So for folks who are looking for that, it's kind of up in the bar with all of the other options um, uh, that for like, all of the other zoom options it in some views is in the like little three dots where you press on that and then you kind of scroll down the menu that comes there so um i just the slide that is up right now is just some some um 
sort of check-ins and guidelines for public participation. Um, if you do want to give public comment, please put it in the chat box. I know we have one person who um, contacted us earlier today to give public comment and another, per at least one other person who has indicated their interest in the chat box. That's coming up in just a few minutes. So if you do want to, um, if you do want to do that, please put it in the chat box now and staff will make sure that you're on the list. Um, if you are logged on to the Zoom, please turn your video off. We're asking that only the video is only for committee members and for staff who are participating in the meeting. Um, public members will be muted by the host unless, um, unless except during the public comment period. And the meeting, just a reminder that the meeting is being recorded and will be available on our website afterwards along with uh, meeting, summary meeting minutes that will be posted a little bit later. So with that, the first thing I would like the committee to do, um, to ask the committee to do is um, approve the meeting minutes from our last meeting, which was March 31st. And um, if you can just raise your hand, if you would approve the minutes, and um, just leave them down if you think that there is a change that is needed. All right, so it looks like everyone, like the meeting minutes, oh, Shanice, are you able to raise your hand? Are we good with the minutes or do you have an amendment? Yes. Okay, great. So the meetings or the meeting minutes from last time are approved and so we'll move on to public comment. So the first person who um, is signed up for public comment is John Moore. And John June or is going to unmute you and I would just ask that you um, if you can keep your public Keep your comment within three minutes. Um, if you start to get close to that time, I'll just um, I'll give you a verbal cue that um, that you're getting close to three minutes. Oh, John phoned in, so he is not on the. Hold on one second. Let's see if we can find John's number. Let's. Let's just open up the, maybe we open up the entire lines and let John speak up. Well, I think, yeah. So can we just open up the phone line? Oh, June's computer froze. James, can you open up the phone line? Yes, I will. Just, just a moment here. I'll unmute all the phones. So please only speak if you are John. <laughs> <laughs> Do we Is that have John? Yeah, I'm on. Okay, it's it's your time, John. You're okay? Yep. Yes. Okay. What I would like to say, both as a participant for the Frog Ferry System, as a volunteer at this point, is that this area of health and transportation is very dear to me, having been born and raised in Oregon my whole life. Um, I have also was born with asthma and have had the participating uh, as a participant in the program in Denver, Colorado for the National Asthma Foundation. And over the years, I have also been involved in transportation from a professional point of view with railroads, some highway and some ferry systems, actually. And I think that the whole idea between connection between transportation and good health is really, really important. And I know that the state has been divided on this issue, and I'm hoping that eventually the health system and perhaps this uh, coronavirus thing will help in establishing a more reasonable um, platform for health and transportation because I don't I, th I don't think the government has ever made that connection. I also don't think an awful lot of businesses have made that connection for years. But if they do start making that connection, I think they will see a very big improvements in their business. 
some major companies have taken it upon themselves to make that part of their bottom line initiative. So that's all I have to say. Thank you, John. Thank you. And Faith, Megan, and Shanice, you all still appear to have your hands up. So I just wanted to make sure that you didn't want to say something. And okay, so if you could put your hands down, that would be great. So we do have one more person signed up um, for to, to give public comment, and that's Anissa Pemberton. Yeah, thank you, Katie. Um, yeah, thank you all for continuing this important and timely work. Um, I hope you, all of you are and your communities are taking care of yourselves at this time. Um, during this public health and economic crisis, it's more pressing than ever that PCEF grant making is launched in an equitable and transparent way. Uh, the PCEF coalition uh, supports the draft guiding principles and we are proud to say that they align greatly with our original campaign. Um, it's clear that you all are censuring justice, local co-benefits, accountability, and community expertise, and we're so proud to support that. Um, finally, I just wanted to add that the PCEF Coalition is willing and excited to work with the Grant Committee to recruit a new Grant Committee member and hopes to be a meaningful resource in that effort. Thank you all so much, and I look forward to hearing about your next steps tonight. All right. Thank you, Anissa. So the next thing on our agenda, and um, we're running, a, the, our timeline, our timing is a little bit off today because we um, we're lucky enough to have Commissioner Hardesty come and, um, and talk with us today. So we're not going to worry too much about sticking to the schedule, um, but and just kind of get as, as far as we need to do to as far as we can get today. It was already a fairly packed agenda and I um, just want to acknowledge that we are running a little bit behind on time, but that we will still make five minutes uh, we still, we'll still make time for a five minute get up and stretch and get a drink of water break, um, probably in about a half an hour or 40 minutes. Sam, Katie, did you want to add I something? Just, yeah, just want to flag that. Yeah, we have one more public comment from Greg, uh, from Greg Har. Oh, sorry, I missed that on the text. Okay, I apologize. Greg, go ahead. Thank you. Um, uh, my name is Greg Har. I'm the uh, founder and executive director for Solar for All. We're a very small uh, local um, nonprofit uh, providing funding for um, installing solar panels on low to moderate income homes. Um, my public comment around uh, PCEF is uh, we had specifically been working with Proud Ground uh, Community Land Trust for a project to install solar on uh, five um, uh, homes that they manage in the uh, greater Portland area. And uh, with the onset of uh, uh, COVID-19, we actually were talking with our, um, with our solar installer that had signed up to support the project. And they were, uh, they were basically having a uh, project canceled due to the, uh, uh, the impact to the, to the virus. And um, it was important to us to uh, help them through this, through this time. And we made the decision as the nonprofit to provide the down payments for those five projects um, in order for them to have some income uh, from our partnership during this time. And uh, I bring this up because in most funding situations, uh, there's a requirement for uh, requests for funds to happen before any project activity starts. And um, we had planned to uh, uh, apply for PISA funds for this project uh, once the application period opened uh, this summer. And we are hoping to be able to continue to do so, even though we have uh, provided some of our co-funding dollars um, ahead of the application uh, period in order to support the uh, um, installer that has signed up to complete this project for us. And uh, so just wanted to make sure that that was upfront and uh, will be uh, something that you would consider when uh, applications uh, open later this summer. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Any questions or comments from the committee? Before we move on to the presentation. All right, so first up is uh, June is going to give our PCEF committee staff person, June Reyes is going to give um, an overview of the summary of public comments on the PCEF draft guiding principles. Great, can y'all hear me? 
Cool, I got some thumbs up. Yep. Um, so I wanted to let you all know sort of how we got input, who we heard from, and some of the results. I also recognize that it's a lot of feedback to digest. Um, so I kind of wanted to also preface with what we're asking of you um, after this presentation in terms of the discussion, which is, you know, uh, please ask your clarifying questions. And, um, you know, I think there's just going to be neat, there's going to be some time that's needed to, to really um, think about how comments might uh, shift the way that the guiding principles are written. I don't know that it's too much, um, but that we come up with a plan to kind of help workshop this language to be able to come up with a final proposal for the guiding principles at the next committee meeting. So um, to begin, the public comment process started um, March 3rd and it went until April 5th. Um, we primarily, primarily got the word out through our email list of 800 plus people. Um, our community partner networks also amplify the comment period, including the Peace of Community Coalition, which helped significantly in getting feedback. I was also advertised on the DPS webpage, and uh, we also did a lot of one-on-one -on -one emails and phone calls with folks um, to, to ask for public comment. Um, we also, you know, we, uh, we put out the public comment as the COVID crisis was ramping up. And so um, some things that we might have done, such as um, having in-person events around the public, around the guiding principles, um, advertising on social media, sending out more emails. Um, there are definitely more pressing things that needed to come out of sort of City of Portland public, uh, communications. And so, um, and also we acknowledge that folks had other things that they needed to uh, be addressing. So that also impacted the process, but I still think we got a lot of good comments um, on the guiding principles. Um, there also was, um, we did some uh, translations of the guiding principles survey as well into Spanish, Vietnamese, and Russian. Um, and uh, we also, I also recognize that part of that outreach was being able to in person provide these at different places that have these language speakers. Um, but, due to the, but due to the public health crisis as well as, um, you know, acknowledging that we need to be able to build more relationships within these um, certain language communities within Portland. And we did, we only got responses in English. Um, the majority of our responses were from the online survey. We didn't receive any calls on the guiding principles and we did receive around 80-ish emails. All right, can we get to the next slide? Um, so as I said, we had around 82 emails, around 130 people answering the online survey. Um, in the memo as part of your meeting materials, it has breakdowns of demographic information. So we have information on ethnicity, race, income, zip code, age, language preference, um, we also asked and we also asked folks to indicate whether or not they identified as one of the priority populations in the ballot measure. So that's um, you know, low, if folks identified as part of a low income community, communities of color, as um, as a woman, as someone who's chronically under, underemployed or a person with disabilities. And so, um, for individuals, if they self identified as one of these groups, and then if you folks were commenting on behalf of a group if they served any of these priority populations. All right, can we hit the next slide? So um, these are some, I'm gonna highlight some comments for each of the principles. Um, I think generally speaking, there's overwhelming agreement with all of the guiding principles. Um, you'll see for all four that most of the responses were in the purple. So that's folks somewhat agreeing or strongly agreeing with the principle that was written. Um, and in the memo, you'll also see that there is sort of this yellow section, and that's sort of a, a subset of folks from the overall data um, that identified from the priority population in the city code, and also indicated that they were okay with us showing their data as part of this group. So it had to be those two things. Um, so to start, with justice driven, um, a lot of commenters appreciated the focus um, on those who have been historically disadvantaged. 
um, and he appreciated the focus on Black and Indigenous people and asked um, questions about how this might be done. Um, some expressed also what that might look like for them in practice. So you'll see that um, folks have already been thinking about um, how this, this guiding principle might be implemented. Um, there are also several commenters who wondered if other identity groups should be called out in addition to Black and Indigenous people. Um, for example, folks offered um, communities of color, um, immigrants, and those experiencing socioeconomic discrimination and wondered if those should be called out in this guiding principle. And lastly, just wanted to flag some questions that also arose around um, how did the committee, um, how did the committee define indigenous? Um, were we talking about indigenous North America? Um, you know, many Latin, there are also a lot of Latinx people who identify as indigenous as well. So what does the committee mean by that? Um, and what do we mean when we talk about disadvantaged and marginalized groups? And so for accountable, as you can see again, that there, was, there were a lot of people who agreed with this principle. A lot of commenters uh, were really glad to see the piece around transparency. I mean, I think that for most of the, um, for, for most folks looking at accountable, I think this one was probably like the most popular one in terms of highest level of agreement. Um, although there were some comments around folks wanting to see if there could be more clarity around who decides what success is and how. And, um, and again, some commenters gave examples of what this principle might look like in practice um, as they put in, as they submitted in their comments. All right, next slide. So the next one is community powered. Um, there was a lot of enthusiasm for this principle, especially the focus on trusting community knowledge and experience. Um, and some commenters had flagged this piece around honor and build on existing work and partnerships. Um, some felt that it seemed to leave out the value of new partnerships in there. And so that's just um, something to flag for you all. And again, um, folks had also talked about in the comments uh, what community power might look like to them um, and how this principle might look like in action for the program. Lastly, we have focused on, lo on local co-benefits. Um, so a lot of comments closer to the deadline of the guiding principles had aligned this principle with the economic recovery efforts um, for the COVID-19 um, public health crisis and that um, this one seemed particularly important and salient because of its mentioning around building resilience and healthy communities to help fight and helping to fight displacement. Although some folks um, had talked about um, not understanding the link between focusing on local co-benefits um, and anti-displacement or mitigating displacement. And, um, and, and a few people had commented that they weren't sure what co-benefits meant and were wondering if that, what um, the committee defined that as. And so um, the next slide kind of goes into recommended areas of discussion based on the, the things that I brought out, but I wanted to kind of go down to the bottom for additional considerations. One of the last questions on the survey after giving feedback on each guiding principle were, are there anything, is there anything that you wanted to add or modify? Um, several people wrote in about um, wanting climate or carbon reduction goals to be called out within the principles and feeling like um, it was uh, it was important enough to be called out on its own. Um, someone else offered wanting to uh, to to provide um, to offer language around levering, leveraging other resources and that to be important. Um, someone had also offered um, to the committee being explicit about naming the intersections with other sectors such as transportation, transportation and housing. Um, and then lastly, um, there was a comment made throughout all of the principles to, um, to put 
to mark somehow that um, throughout all these principles or the processes that are happening, that marginal, marginalized people are centered throughout. And that may just be sort of how the preamble to the principles kind of gets written out um, and a better understanding of how these principles might be used to address that comment. So that was a lot, I know. Um, maybe if we can now open it up for any clarifying questions or comments that folks had. So seeing no hands flying up. Oh, Robin. Yeah, uh, thank you for digging through all this data. Um, <laughs> I don't know how you did it, uh, but uh, kudos for, for doing so. Um, let's see, I had two questions, uh, two general questions. One is um, in all the responses, it seems like there was like one or two uh, people uh, or comments that um, disagreed or somewhat disagreed with um, what we had put forth. Um, do you have any sense of, you know, is it the same person or is it, you know, varies across the board? Um, uh, or is it a narrow group of people? I'm, I'm kind of curious, you know, if the dissenters are, uh, are spread across or is just, you know, a, a handful of, of individuals. Um, so that's um, my, 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 my first question. Um, and, um, you know, I can't remember my second question. <laughs> so I'll let you answer that one and maybe I can remember what my second question is. Yeah, sure. Um, so I, for the folks who strongly disagreed, I think that's maybe, there was maybe one or two. It was the same person throughout. Um, and that person had also indicated that they weren't comfortable with the public comment. And so um, I think that, um, yeah, I think the, it's fair to say that this was, um, yeah, this is, just, this is one person. Um, and they didn't provide too much additional comments other than just the rating scale um, for that. Okay, thank you. Uh, and I remember my second question, and, and that is, of all the comments that you received, uh, and I think this might have been summarized, potentially summarized in the last slide, um, w w were there any that kind of surfaced up to, to the top that you, you heard time and time again uh, that, you know, kind of, maybe really warrant a conversation. Um, you know, I noticed, I know you put in, identified a few, few key important things that you identified, but are, are there issues that just really kind of bubbled up to the top over and over again? Yeah, Katie, can you go back to the last, to the previous slide? Um, yeah, so um, I think the, the three, the three sort of top ones would be, um, really defining Black and Indigenous, uh, or like why the why there is that focus, um, and you know, defining um, what Indigenous means in this program. Uh, I would say the second one is that came up a lot were uh, was around the climate impact and being able to. Um, I think for for some folks it seemed like it was there wasn't a tie enough to the the climate sort of goals of this program. Um, and then the third, I would say, would just be around the co-benefits question, um, because it seemed like overall folks could kind of understand it, but there was some ambiguity in how this tie took place um, and displacement. And then I, um, I think with that, there, you know, like where does labor fit in into um, these principles and, and that value? Okay, thank you. Any other comments or questions? Shini? Uh, first, uh, I just wanna say thank you for putting this all together and um, analyzing, you know, the themes that uh, we are hearing from community and, um, you know, which is important to, to help us frame and guide the process. And, and so um, as we're looking through this slideshow, I am help 
or I'm, I guess, curious about uh, when we just started this discussion, we were unpacking some of the uh, ways in which we looked at responses based off of who we heard from and the demographics of those folks. And um, I guess, in short, my question is the priorities that have been elevated to the top um, after analyzing the public comment, um, are those also reflective uh, of, of, that, of that core group? So we're saying about, um, we gotta get back to the slide, but uh, based off of, uh, you know, uh, being a woman and or person of color, um, that 30%, if you will, of those folks might be representative of that group. And I know there was a comment earlier about uh, who we engaged with and if they identified with a, a, a target area in the, um, in the fund. June, I went back to the um, online survey results slide. So I don't know if you wanted to just kind of highlight the two different response groups that are given in those bar charts. Yeah, um, so the so the, the top bar is all of the responses that we received together, and then the yellow one below it are, is, is a subset of priority populations. Um, and so is the, was it your question, Shanice, around um, the comments that I had sort of elevated at the end, are those indicative of all or just the subset? Uh, yes, I, I was curious if that was just the, the general group at large, the, the comments there. Yeah, so if we can, so if we go back one, I would say that um, the, for the priority populations, the, the things that were elevated the most, um, in terms of these comments would be around um, how like black and indigenous folks would be centered and additional communities of color being named and um, including um, immigrants and women of color and also a defining indigenous. Um, and then um, the co-benefits piece and offering around talking about labor as well as, as, well as um, the, the favoring of like the, of um, mitigating displacement as a value was also really appreciated. Um, I didn't, from the priority population, I didn't hear uh, much around um, highlighting what the climate impacts and the carbon goals would be um, or leveraging other resources. But the two last considerations, naming intersections with other sectors so housing and transportation was one that came out of the priority population group, as well as how this program is going to continue center, centering the most marginalized. Is that helpful? Yeah, that's actually very helpful, especially as, you know, when we developed these uh, as a group, um, we were kind of discussing what climate justice looks like for the committee, right? Reflective of this work. And uh, that, that really is a result of uh, what the coalition um, has advocated and continue to advocate for, but the space that climate justice means, uh, right? Transportation justice, racial justice, and that um, the green and clean energy work um, within these uh, communities with these lens, with this lens, I think uh, is, is going to make the highest impact uh, that we need and also reflective of that, that uh, I think spirit. So that's helpful for me to analyze, right? Uh, I think uh, public comment and all of this other engagement um, that uh, you just do such a great job doing. Uh, but in light of COVID, right, um, I do know public processes, this business as usual, we do, uh, it does make an impact on uh, the ways in which um, folks can participate and have their uh, priorities lifted up or centered. And so I um, appreciate you sharing 
where the priority populations are at here. And I would just echo uh, animating with that notion of uh, Black and Indigenous folks uh, throughout each component of our work and you know what it looks like to take next steps to take the lens of really looking at that language uh, at the ballot and uh, uh, informing that with the with the comments that we've heard in and trying to weave that together but I don't know if folks have any other thoughts but those are some of the reactions I have. Well, I, so if, um, I would love to hear from other folks their kind of questions or reactions too, but I just also wanted to kind of remind everyone that at the beginning of June's presentation, um, one of the things that sort of one of our goals going into this is to either identify um, if you think that if you think these guiding principles, given what you have heard from the public in terms of feedback, if you are comfortable with move, kind of moving these forward and finalizing them, or um, alternatively, if there are if folks have some ideas about um, kind of what a next step might be to workshop them a little bit and get them so that we can make a proposal, one of you can make a proposal at our next meeting to finalize the guiding principles. Andrea? Thanks, Katie. June, uh, I just want to say thank you. Um, and thanks to the whole team. The memo was really helpful and so so thoughtfully organized, it made it really easy for me to review the information. Thank you. Um, I mean, you know, I remember in the workshop where we had the a final conversation before releasing these for public comment, we agreed as a group that if we included some of this language, such as um, particularly Black and Indigenous communities, um, kind of highlighting uh, those communities for particular um, support and inclusion, we were going to have to do education and we were committing to talking about that as a group um, and as a program. And I kind of came away from this with a lot of like, well, what did you mean by this? Not just with that area, but with, you know, accountability and other things. And it um, kind of said to me, well, we're raising the right questions when people read these guiding principles and we're going to have to commit to answering them. So I, I walked away from this thinking, wow, we did a great job. And thanks to the staff for supporting that conversation. Um, and, and, and we're gonna have to explain what we mean. Mm -hmm. Megan? Hi, yeah, I echo the, the comments by my fellow committee members. Thank you, June, for the great presentation and memo and, and the clear answers so far. And I appreciate um, kind of the suggestions you bring up about areas to discuss um, and kind of your suggestions for refinement seem very thoughtful to me. So I appreciate them as a good place for us to focus. Um, but you asked, one of your questions was, how do we workshop these? And I'm curious, we do have, you know, only limited time at this meeting and you want us to approve them at the next meeting. So I'm, I guess I, I do have some thoughts. I don't know that we have time for all nine of us to give thoughts right now. So I wonder if you're asking us to like send you emails or have phone calls individually just to give individual thoughts. I don't know that that will build nine member um, agreement or that we, get, we won't also get the benefit of sort of group hearing each other thinking through things, but, um, but in the time frame, maybe that's a way of doing it. So that's one thought I have. Um, I do have thoughts, but again, I don't know about taking time right now. So, I mean, June, did you have something? No, you could go. Okay. I, so, I mean, one thing that I guess I'm hearing is that um, one way to kind of workshop it with an outcome of having nine, having all nine people kind of on the same page with moving forward would be to make time to discuss this. Um, probably not tonight. I don't think we have time tonight, but to make it make time and space in another meeting to discuss it. Um, one thing I will just note that we did last time was 
there was one um, there was one guiding principle that folks felt like just needed a little bit of like wordsmithing and tweaking, but there was kind of the group was, all felt comfortable that they were on the same page, you know, generally with the idea that it just needed a little bit of work. And then so Sam worked with a couple of committee members to do that wordsmithing, and we were able to kind of approve those for going out for public comment. So I'll just offer that up as like another potential opportunity. So Ranfis and then Andrea and Megan, just you both still have your hand up, which is fine if you want to talk again, just, just a reminder. Ranfis. Uh, I was actually curious what uh, Megan had to propose. Um, I, 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 you know, I think I just wanted to, and since you mentioned it, Katie, I think I was going to propose that. I think um, given that we've done that in the past, if there's any opportunities for us to um, break up some of these pieces, you know, I think I'm willing to commit some time in between now and the next meeting to try to fine tune these. I know, I know, I think the community powered one was especially one. Um, we had uh, a lot of deliberation on um, uh, post post our initial meeting on this. And, you know, I think, you know, uh, frankly, I'm glad that we've, well, one, I want to thank, you know, the compilation of this memo. And then two, it's great to hear the feedback. It's always great to move from an echo chamber. Um, and I'm, yeah, I think I'm really uh, willing to sort of fine tune this and make sure that we're landing on in, you know, more inclusiveness, more, you know, expressing what justice is for other folks. Cause I, I think ultimately I want folks to see themselves um, to be part of this program and make sure that we address historical harm. Um, but yeah, I just want to echo uh, again, your um, suggestion, Katie, I think that's a great idea. And then I just want to hear from other folks, any, any additional ideas. Robin. Yeah, I'm, I would be in general agreement here. I think, in my opinion, um, you know, keep in mind that the vast majority of responses, we had uh, over 100 people, uh, that's like 95% or whatever that math turns out to be, um, you know, strongly supportive of what we initially put out. So in my opinion, um, I think this is what, we, what is required is more of a polishing um, and, and not kind of back to the drawing board. And um, I think I'm also supportive if, if there's a small group that um, can can work on that, um, and I think as Andrea, Andrea said, um, maybe including some definitions that, that kind of surround uh, these guiding principles, so that we're all on the same page when we use a term. Um, so that's my additional comments. Any of the other, Michael? Oh, you're muted. Okay, there you are. Right. Can you hear me? All right. Um, yeah. I just was going to say that on page four of the of the memo, um, I did like the there was a comment that was address historic and current discrimination, which is our language currently, would be better defined as a path to resolving or having restorative justice, and I did like the positive aspect of that as opposed to historical negative that it was like a forward looking i mean and it's once again just wordsmithing but um yeah i that was that was one thing that did stand out to me in the in the public comments maria thanks june and team for organizing this information so that we can have a good discussion now and after. Um, I felt like most of the comments were really affirming and it felt um, felt great to see a lot of synergy between the topics that people raised or comments that they raised along with the ones that we had in our small circles. So I feel like we were on the right track. There is one, um, one aspect of the feedback that I am curious um, to discuss a little bit more, which is around the um, the carbon uh, and quantifying carbon impacts, and and if that falls in community, I'm sorry, if that falls in focused on local co-benefits or accountability, um, and just figuring out if if that's something we should spend more time on. But overall, I 
don't have any strong feelings against any of the comments and feel like I can trust anybody on this team to wordsmith further so that we can adopt these principles. So I'll just, um, I guess I will just make one comment that um, about, and also a reminder that Michael, your hand is still up unless you wanted to speak again. The, um, but that when we put the guiding principles out, because we did talk a lot about this as staff, one of the things that we tried to do was sort of put this big umbrella of um, climate work and greenhouse gas reduction over the top, saying that this is like, this is, this is climate work and it's going to be guided by these principles. And so we were hoping that that would kind of, that that would address that, you know, that we would say this like greenhouse gas reduction, this climate, mitigation, adaptation, and resiliency is embedded in all of these guiding principles, but these are how we're going to do that work. Um, so we even came up with a graphic that James drew on the whiteboard and June tried, turned into di digitized, but um, I'm not sure if kind of as part of going through the survey because they weren't commenting on that overarching thing, that maybe it got missed. Um, but that's a good, that was sort of good feedback for us too, because we didn't feel like it was missing if people were looking at the whole, at the whole picture. So um, I think there might be ways for us to address those comments um, without having to kind of create another guiding principle or speak to how you quantify greenhouse gas reductions within them. So I'm just th throwing that out there for consideration. So I think, oh, Faith. Uh, I just wanted to double tap everything everyone has said and both the appreciation, but uh, also that this felt very affirming. And I'd be really comfortable with a small group of us just doing a polish for adopting at the next meeting. So maybe we can even move on with that. Sounded like there's okay. uh, agreement on that. That sounds great. And so maybe what we'll do is just follow up with an email and um, solicit a small enough group that we're, you know, we're not not outside of this sort of subcommittee and committee structure, but just a small group to do that kind of wordsmithing and polishing work with staff. Anything else, June? Um, no, thank you all. Um, and if you have any other questions, feel free to email or call me. All right, Sam, you made yourself visible, which makes me think you have something to say. No, no, no? I'm, just ready for okay. I'm just ready to move on to the next email. Okay, to go. all right. <laughs> so um, does, does anybody need, uh, feel like they need to stand up and get a drink of water for two minutes or should we just keep keep going? We're good? Okay. I saw a couple of people who looked like, well, I could get up and get a drink of water, but um, so I'm going to, um, the next presentation is I'm going to ask, J it is going to be James Valdez, who is another uh, member of the PSF staff who you all are familiar with, who is going to um, give you an update on, or no, wait, never mind. I apologize. Mm -hmm. I got mixed up in the agenda. The next is Sam, who's going to give an update on committee membership um, recruitment and nomination process. Thank you, Katie. Um, so we sent you all a memo um, this past earlier this week where we outlined um, uh, essentially a new committee member recruitment uh, plan for you all to evaluate, consider, discuss, and adopt. And I think maybe just to keep sort of this conversation moving since it's outlined there, I think the pieces that I would highlight and the, the pieces that we're gonna, we, we wanna at least bring your focus to today um, is that uh, what we will do in, in, the, in the timeline that we've identified, we would be assuming that um, we can get to potentially approval here today. Uh, we would post an online application starting next week. Ideally, we could have it up potentially as early as Monday, and we would keep that open for three weeks. Um, and then we would check in at that point to see just how many number of applications. Assuming that we have at least 15 applications, we'd close it at that point um, and then get into the evaluation. If we didn't have at least 15, we would extend it for another week. Um, and so that gives you at least a little sense of the timeline. We'd compile those applications. 
And then we would send those applications out to uh, uh, a, a recruitment subcommittee. And so that's going to be the ask here today is um, to see who would be interested in sitting on a recruitment subcommittee. We'd like to have at least two um, PCEF committee members. And uh, Laura John, the city's tribal liaison director, has already offered uh, to be um, uh, to be a support in that subcommittee or be part of that subcommittee, however you all decide would be relevant to have her there. Um, and so then we would uh, we would work within that subcommittee to review and evaluate applications with the anticipation to bring those to the committee um, anywhere between um, May 18th, May 20. Um, we would review those applications May 18th, May 27th, with the expectation that we forward those on to the full committee for discussion and evaluation um, in, the, in a June meeting date. And then um, subsequently, assuming um, we potentially get to a recommendation in that or a nomination in that committee meeting, we would forward those on to City Council for likely going up in front of City Council June or July. Um, so that's that's at a high level. That's that's the timeline and the the solicitation language, which is within the memo, which we've reviewed with with a handful of community members as well as uh, Laura uh, Laura John, is that the we would put this out with the solicitation. It's a generic, it's a general application for city advisory bodies, but the solicitation itself would say that the, the committee, the PCEF committee is seeking a community member with knowledge of Native American history and understanding of the diversity of the local American Indian and Alaska Native community and issues surrounding the urban Indian experience. And so, um, so I think that's, that's I, I've, uh, I'm sure there's, there's more I could say, but I'd like to kind of pause and um, turn it around to you all and see if anyone has any thoughts, feedback, reflections on this, um, and then um, I'd like to turn it over to seeing who would be interested in sitting on and assuming if the, I'd like to get a sense from the broader community if this plan looks okay, um, we can move into um, squaring away what a recruitment subcommittee could look like. Did everybody have an opportunity to read the the um, the memo that Sam sent out? I think uh, Andrea unmuted herself, but I do think that it. So I, you're next, despite your hand not being up. But I um, I do think that um, if everything does look okay, because it is a responsibility of the committee to um, to sort of advance new names for confirmation. That's one of the things in the code that we probably should make a proposal and vote on that proposal to actually like sort of direct staff to issue the recruitment. That's right. So, and Thank Andrea? Uh, uh, thanks for putting this together. And um, I guess one question I have about the solicitation language, I, I can't remember, it's been now a year since I read the one that I responded to. Um, I assume there's a bunch of language in there about conflict and, uh, mm -hmm. And, and all of that, since that was kind of the issue with the first candidate that was identified by the original five committee members, um, was that that person ended up having a conflict. Uh, I don't want to get to the place where we have five outstanding applicants who then have a conflict. So uh, that would be important to me. Um, I appreciate that. I, I will say that um, yes, there's been a lot of learned le lessons learned since that since the since the original recruitment, um, and one of those have certainly been just how we talk about conflicts of interest and and, and sort of uh, not sort of just the, the level of um, the level of uh, avoidance of conflicts of interest that we have to do on this committee. So that's that's something we will be clearly stating within um, the recruitment, as well as just a few things that weren't as 100% clear, which is folks have to be a resident of the city of Portland. Um, and, and, and there's maybe one or two other criteria. So we will be pretty clearly stating those. And apologies, I should have included that here, but that, that would be, that would absolutely be part of the solicitation. Great, perfect, thank you. Robin? Yeah, um, so clearly we're gonna have to recruit again in the future. Uh, when, we don't know, but at some point we're gonna have to recruit again in the future. Um, is this plan intended to be kind of a, 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 a initial plan for future recruitments or is this just more of a, a one-off uh, or maybe it's kind of a TBD? At the, at the moment, this plan is for this particular recruitment. 
Um, so we are working. I mean, we've we've identified the fact that, we, and we'll bring this to you ideally in the next committee meeting. We'll, we'll daylight um, the by the work the bylaw subcommittee has been doing, but there will be working agreements. So within working agreements, we do expect that'll be a placeholder and a place where you can identify broader sort of recruitment intentions where the next vacancies come up. So this particular plan is for this next recruitment, um, and I think that there's going to be work ahead to identify sort of collectively how you how you want to send a signal for future vacancies um, and, and that can take place in a recruitment plan that would um, that would be adopted by you all at a later date. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or clarifications for Sam? Michael? Oh, muted. I know. I, it used to be I could push my space button and it would unmute me and it's not doing it anymore. Um, mm. Sorry. Uh, is it time to make a proposal? Uh, I'd propose that we go ahead and um, do the uh, committee member recruitment plan as put forward by the PCF staff um, today, um, making sure that it does also include the uh, conflict of interest uh, questions and notes the importance of zero conflict of interest. Thank you. Shanice? Uh, I second that motion. Yeah. Great. So I think this is our first vote, our first virtual vote. And I think um, just for the sake of the folks on the phone and for the recording, um, if you don't mind, I'm going to go ahead and um, and just call your name and you can indicate uh, whether or not you are support or whether or not you're supporting or, or objecting. Andrea? I support. Faith? Yeah, I agree. Jeff? I support. Maria? I support the proposal. Ramses? Uh, I support the proposal. Megan? I support. Robin? I support. All right. And Michael and Shanice, you both already supported it by putting it forth and seconding it. So excellent. Thank you guys very much. Sam, is there anything else? Well, then now I would like a, I guess folks can, I, I'd like to get a proposal on a subcommittee. Uh, <laughs> some, volunteers, a subcommittee. some volunteers, mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> Megan? Um, I'd be happy to be in a subcommittee. If other people are very excited, I'm also happy to step back. <laughs> okay. And Michael? I, yep. I'm just raising my hand to volunteer for the subcommittee. Great. Maria? Another interest. Same. Another Looks like volunteer. But I can also step back if needed. Well, I mean, you can certainly, so Sam, I think that you'll probably be, um, that, that looks good. Three, a three person subcommittee is totally, totally workable. So we'll follow up um, with trying to get something scheduled and um, with Michael, Maria and Megan. Okay. Thank you. All right. So now we are going to ask James Valdez to, um, give an update to the committee on capacity building um, activities that PSF staff have been working on. And right. Megan, I'm gonna lower your hand. All right, um, we'll go ahead and um, get started then. And just reflecting that this is uh, the result of a lot of work that has been going on a little bit behind the scenes. Um, and this is the first time that we're, we're bringing this, um, to this presentation to you um, and that they're just noting the work that the um, PCF coalition has, has been doing previous even to us coming on as staff um, in capacity building and elements of outreach and um, trying to understand what the needs are of organizations to get ready to apply for, for funds. Um, and so this is a result of um, a lot of months of thought and work um, but also recognizing that we're in a slightly different place now um, with with COVID crisis and that we will have to adapt things slightly um, in response. So go ahead and go to the next slide. 
So I want to go through a few of the major elements of capacity building or really resourcing organizations to be ready to apply um, that we had that we're proposing and we're moving forward with um, as we speak. And so um, we've recognized that there's a need from organizations, especially smaller organizations, to get up to speed about some of the kind of fundamental elements of applying for grants, having budgets and financial resources um, in line, um, understanding the grant administration side of things. Um, and in general, uh, we've always planned to provide um, opportunities for webinars and ongoing trainings, uh, or I'm sorry, ongoing trainings and workshops. Um, in the COVID crisis, we're also recognizing that a lot of those um, ideas of workshops and trainings need to manifest as webinars or virtual spaces because we can't gather people together. Um, though we plan to be able to, as you know, this crisis recedes and um, we're more in a recovery phase, to be able to do in-person events uh, later in the year, hopefully. Um, and so these are, this is kind of a, a diagram of a number of elements that we see happening, some in parallel, some kind of staged um, in, in phases, um, but that would be elements that continue on that aren't just a, a single moment in time. And so um, the top one there is this opportunity for uh, training uh, that would be available for any organization that wants to receive free training on different topics related to getting ready to apply for funds. Um, the second element there is really providing additional resources and financial uh, support for organizations to be ready to apply um, and to attend those trainings. And so we envision um, being able to make available small, smallish amounts of funds, um, a maximum of up to uh, $5,000 per organization um, for, for, for participating in training, um, for acquiring any necessary technology that they might need, especially in this time, to participate in webinars or engage in those trainings, and to apply uh, and to prepare themselves and um, really prepare their application. Um, we also envision the opportunity through vendors that provide training to have one-on-one -on -one, um, accessibility, where if a small organization has questions, they would have a, a specific amount of hours of um, kind of one-on-one -on -one con consultation available, not from us as staff, but from um, a technical assistance provider. And so um, all of this is kind of in the framework of we of the fact that we uh, have funds within our kind of administrative budget to do capacity building efforts and to um, help provide resources to get organizations ready. For this category of organizational preparation resources, um, we, we anticipate that this would be very targeted and would be focused on smaller organizations um, that serve frontline communities and really would have some criteria attached to it. Another element um, that we are still very much developing um, and don't have a full proposal for yet, um, but it is around the, uh, the development of cohorts or um, a longer term, potentially year long or 18 month long groups of, of organizations that could spend some time together identifying community needs and really building proposals over time um, while being supported financially for that participation. Um, and these could be either the cohorts or the development of that cohort could be done either through um, structured selection of uh, different cultural groups based on uh, the priorities that are in the guiding principles and that you all um, are moving forward, or there could be a geographic focus if, that's, if that seems to be a better approach. Um, and there could be a lot of flexibility in kind of how that community engagement happens to identify the needs. And then the fourth element there is really a capacity building through what I think uh, we all have talked about um, really, which is planning grants or the opportunity for entities and organizations to apply for funds from PCEF to then develop and um, build proposals for longer term projects. And so those are the four major elements, and I'm going to talk through a little, few more details of a couple of them right now. Um, so go ahead and go forward. Yep. So um, related to near-term opportunities for webinars and trainings, um, we've identified 
a few key areas where um, we receive feedback um, that there's a need and that we want to be able to move forward quickly um, with procurement of these services for training. And without getting into too much of uh, the mechanics of city procurement, um, we've, gone, we've gone through a couple different paths and are currently, um, while we intended to do this through a competitive process, the really the only path that we have, especially currently with the COVID crisis, is to do um, kind of a direct contract with organizations um, that are already certified through something called COBID, um, not to be confused, which is a state cert certification for minority women emerging, emerging small business firms. And so um, there are some uh, providers of these technical resources and trainings, and uh, we would we anticipate that in the coming weeks we'll be um, reaching out and developing contracts to provide these trainings around the topics of grant writing, uh, financing projects, levering resources, accounting and grant administration, marketing and communications needs, and then legal insurance and risk management needs. And um, these are elements that we have asked for feedback in a few different venues over the past months. Um, we had questions about capacity building even in the first public event that we did in September where we tried to identify some of the needs. However, we recognize that these kind of near-term elements are far from the only needs that organizations have for training and for building their organizational resources um, in order to be ready to apply. So if we go to the next slide. So we also have a longer term path um, for doing a competitive solicitation for training resources um, for multiple other, other topics. And some of these might look familiar in the sense that they're some of the topic areas of Portland Clean Energy Fund, um, including things around uh, renewable energy, energy efficiency, workforce development. Um, but also we want to be able to provide um, organizations that either receive grants or they're looking to uh, receive grants, opportunities for training on racial equity impacts um, and historical disparities within and, and really be able to develop a, a broad baseline understanding of uh, the, the cultural and racial impacts of the projects that um, they would be looking to propose. And so um, this is a longer term opportunity that we're going to be going out uh, to bid for. Um, and that we anticipate w these trainings will not be available until more like the fall. Um, whereas the previous side of trainings, we want to be able to have some of those resources in place before applications start. And then um, the other element uh, that I want to talk about it, which gets to something that um, Michael had mentioned in, in last, uh, last, the last meeting, is really how we engage with community organizations, how we um, prioritize frontline groups and get an understanding of what their near-term needs are. And so for, for many months, um, there had been a group that was first organized by folks from within the Portland Clean Energy Fund Coalition um, that then we helped facilitate as well um, around capacity building. And that took a pause over the last couple months. And we're now restarting that group, um, which is uh, going to be called the Organizational Capacity and Resource Work Group and this is going to be a open platform for organizations to provide us as staff feedback on how we should be scheduling trainings, what the most current needs are, what sort of capacity building activities we should be putting into this longer term RFP. Um, and so we initially envision that these will be available as uh, two times per month, um, potentially ramping down kind of as we, as we build that, that uh, suite of resources and we get more into the implementation. Um, and that we intend re really to expand this group to be available to any organization that wants to provide input, um, but that we, we would seek to really prioritize the perspectives and needs of frontline organizations in how we respond to that and how we um, implement some of those trainings and, and those resources. So I wanted to, I guess, uh, pause for now and offer any um, an opportunity for questions if there are any, but this was intended to just be a kind of brief staff update of what we're doing in regard to capacity building and resources that we are seeking to deploy.
So I guess raise hands if you, oh. Yep. Robin. Hi, thanks for sharing. Um, two questions. Um, one, um, the, the funding for this, this effort, uh, I, I think it's separate from the grant funding. So if um, you can confirm that um, uh, and, and kind of where, where that funding to put all these cohorts and classes and workshops uh, is coming from. Uh, and then the second one is, is kind of the selection. Is there a selection process? Um, you know, what if you design the system, you know, this, th these programs, let's say 50 organizations and, you know, 100 end up applying. How is, how is that kind of, you know, vetted out? Um, yeah, thanks. Yeah, um, thanks for the question, Robin. And yes, you, you are correct that the funding for these capacity building resources comes from effectively the administrative um, bucket of, of, uh, of resources, not from the grant funds themselves. And so um, there, there are funds available that we had earmarked for capacity building trainings. And we had initially intended actually to do, be doing more um, by this point. And so some of those would be deployed to actually provide um, some of that financial support. And we recognize that, you know, up to $5,000 per organization is not that much. Um, but we would we will be developing criteria um, to that align with the goals of PSEP to, to prioritize um, organizations. And there might, I, I don't know, Sam, if you want to um, speak additionally to this, but this is something that could could be a future part of of work, um, and yeah, it, it's not. Yeah, I, I I think I mean I think all of these these are these are all pieces. At least some of these are some of these other pieces are. One, I'll acknowledge, I'll confirm. Yes, it's part of our administrative budget. Um, two, some of these pieces, the details we're still working on, and we want to make sure that it's it's yeah, as we open up the application that we've got a process that makes it easy for folks, particularly, you know, it, it's it's gonna be targeted. This isn't just necessarily a fund that we'd expect anyone to go for, but certainly smaller organizations that are thinner on capacity. Um so there's still work to be detailed on those, um, but but I'd certainly happy to answer any more questions. Megan. Yeah, thank you all for this thoughtful development. Um I just want to say that I really appreciate the thinking, particularly behind, and I know this is a little bit more down the line, but behind the more targeted funding to organizations and cohort development. I particularly like the cohort development idea. Um, I know that, again, is down the line, not the most urgent thing, but I really like the idea of deep relationship building and um, leadership development and, and really hearing groups, frontline groups particularly needs in, in, in a deeper way than kind of, you know, workshops would enable. Um, so I'm excited to see your further development of that part um, going forward. Great. Thank you, Megan. All right, any final comments? Thanks, James. Good job. All right, y'all, we have one more thing to get through. So I think everybody, if, if you feel like it, should just stand up for a minute and take a deep breath. Have a little stretch. If you're Michael, just sit there and watch. Okay. All right. And now, Ramses is going to wow us all uh, with a, an update on our kind of thinking of the grant review process. Um, and I will turn it over to him in just one second, just to sort of, just as um, a launch. I think that I want to say that it's highly likely we will have, we will come back to this in the next meeting. But um, these are the things that we wanted to get through tonight. Um, first, we wanted to just kind of address the review process issues that were raised by the committee and note that um, some of them have been kind of we heard the the subcommittee heard the feedback from the full committee and has integrated that feedback into this new recommendation some of them um, we some of them some of the comments are comments that we will need to um, 
go back to in the future and talk about. Um, an example being the comment that Michael made about eligibility criteria, um, about one of the eligibility criteria being that state licensed workers get prevailing wage. That's a that's a is an issue that we certainly need to um, talk through, but it isn't necessarily an issue that we need to address before um, being able to approve kind of the bigger, just a larger process. And um, and then, so I'm going to turn it over to Ramses. We, in between our last committee meeting and this committee meeting, the subcommittee did meet um, and talk through um, kind of what we heard from you and do some thinking about how we could tweak the review process that we were recommend recommending, and Ramses is going to run through that. Yeah, thanks, Katie. Um, so I guess I'll head into the next slide and for I guess folks on the call um, we are on slide 20 so the review process proposal so uh, for committee members um, this will be a, a re-review of our discussion last week as uh, Katie noted um, and so I'll review these and I'll try to help uh, provide some clarifying points through these each of these slides and then of course um, uh, it'd be great to sort of uh, pause and get some feedback from folks. Um, uh, but again, I think this again is the framework or the skeleton. And again, um, what we're hoping is to at least approve this um, uh, either this meeting or the uh, succeeding meeting, uh, just so we can start to begin to flush out um, uh, the grant making uh, process. Uh, and so, um, again, the proposal, the framework includes the eligibility screening. So this is a process, again, that would um, be one of the initial screening processes that would be um, uh, something led by staff. It would also include a substantive review. Um, so one of the items that we included is a threshold review. So again, um, in the event uh, that there are a uh, high volume of applications um, and obviously a limited capacity for us to review um, in separate committees uh, to include a threshold of review process uh, that ensures that um, uh, we limit the number of applications that we're reading, but making sure that it's um, competitive applications uh, rise to the top. Um, so the next component is a technical review. So again, making sure that uh, in this process as needed, uh, especially for really technical, um, complex uh, projects um, or programs um, that we have subject matter uh, experts um, involved in the review process to ensure, um, uh, to ensure uh, that the projects are technically feasible, uh, uh, financially feasible, uh, and that things that are coming towards um, the scoring panel uh, are uh, had at least some a technical review um, uh, screening process, um, and then I think for the scoring panel, this would involve uh, both again committee members, um, staff, um, and other potential community members. This would involve individual scoring, uh, provide an applicant opportunity to respond to scores after we aggregate them um, and average them all. Uh, and provide any specific clarifying questions. Um, and then I think this uh, third bullet point here for the scoring panel um, provides an opportunity for us as a, uh, within each panel committee to uh, discuss and revise scores uh, as needed. Um, this ultimately will lead to the final component, which is a summary report sent to the full uh, committee uh, for a slate of recommendations for grants being made. Um, and allows for an opportunity for the committee to provide any portfolio uh, balancing. Um, and so this, this, this process um, will be the basic steps for the small and large grants, which we'll uh, re-review here in the next slide. Um, uh, and just wanted to note that the reporting process uh, may look differently. Um, however, I think what we're trying to uh, say here is that the uh, review process will be what in, in this uh, framework in this slide uh, on slide 20. Um, 
Let's see here. And uh, I guess next slide. Uh, Katie, did I miss anything? Yeah, I mean, the only thing I guess that I would um, j just to reiterate what Ramsey said that um, this is this is the framework that we would like the grant commit. This is the proposal for the full committee. This is that small and large grants go through these steps. What the what the documentation that is required and the and the detail that is required within each of those steps will be different depending on if it's a small grant or a large grant. So there will be, um, you know, there will be less documentation and kind of less less detail and less burden for smaller grants than there are for larger grants. But everyone will kind of go through these steps. So um, just wanted to reiterate that and then just to make sure that folks understood that we recognize there's a ton of detail within all of these steps, but what we're asking for is full, the full committee to kind of give feedback to the subcommittee and to staff and say, you know, either we like your, this, this proposal as a framework or, um, and so you can now go move forward and tell us what are all of the criteria within eligibility screening and what exactly does a threshold review look like and those sorts of things. Or if you think that that should be something different than to give us that feedback. Does that make sense? Okay, next slide. Uh, and so here in this slide will be um, slide 21. Um, we'll be talking about the mini grants review process proposal. Um, so the, the purpose of the mini grants uh, is um, to be responsive. So in order for a, a grant process to be responsive to the needs of grantees or applicants, uh, we're proposing for shorter timeframes. So uh, ensuring, you know, that, that the, um, for these items, a low burden for items that are lower budget and require less, less scrutiny. So again, the overall purpose is responsiveness um, to the needs um, that might be urgent and timely. Um, I think uh, options, so um, we can define what eligible expenditures um, and that staff administers this pr uh, part of the process, uh, define scoring criteria and allow for staff to make decisions, uh, staff score and bring package of recommended mini grants to committee at defined time intervals. Um, and then I guess there's a subcommittee, uh, last option is subcommittee reviews, scores, and approves um, mini grants. Um, again, I think the oh. overall intent here um, is responsiveness. Um, and then I think uh, slide 22 here, um, recommendations um, for the mini grants review proposal. Um, just define the eligible exp expenditures, um, what kinds of uh, types of projects that we want to fund, um, whether it's um, uh, a field trip, um, a small equipment to pr purchase, um, define what the cap per year uh, and for applicant. Um, uh, so making sure that we're providing opportunities for um, other uh, organizations, um, especially organizations that don't historically receive grants, um, making sure that we're allocate out annual amount for a mini grant program. So ensuring that there is um, funds allocated for this program, accept applications quarterly, confirm eligibility, randomize selection of applications received for that quarter, roll over any unexpended uh, funds to next quarter. Um, uh, the last two recommendations is two staff uh, confirm that uh, applicant is eligible and that an expenditure is eligible. Um, so here we're um, recommending that staff be part of the uh, confirmation uh, process. Um, and then limited, um, last bullet point here is uh, limited reporting requirements. Again here, I think the, the, the recommendations here is having a process um, for a mini grant to be responsive um, to urgent needs that may arise for um, uh, prospective applicants. Um, I will um, uh, pause there and I think just add that I think, um, uh, yeah, that I think this is, I think 
Um, yeah, I'll pause there. I don't know if there's anything else, Katie, that I missed um, that you'd want to highlight. Um, I don't think so, except for that that fourth bullet is kind of a lot, unless you were in the in the subcommittee and kind of talked through it. And so I just wanted to make sure that folks um, like felt comfortable that they understood. The idea would be that um, I applications would be received by us could be could come in on an ongoing basis but none of them would be reviewed until sort of like a deadline on a quarterly basis then we would just confirm that they were eligible and then randomize the selection and that was a suggestion of the subcommittee um the subcommittee members who felt like having things on a first come first serve basis might um benefit folks who have more staff capacity to kind of be in the know and be quick about these things and um, so we wanted to split the money up so that it was on a quarterly basis and then randomize the sort of selection of applications received by a specific date. So I think that unless there are any questions, I think that I just want to make sure that folks understood kind of the thinking behind that. All right. This is a slide with a lot of words on it. Go for it, Rancy. <laughs> Uh, all right, uh, so this is slide 23, folks, from the call. Um, uh, so the key decision points uh, within the review process. Uh, so again, the recommendations for year one have a single uh, solicitation for year one. Um, allow for online email and snail mail written application submission. Um, and just being clear, no uh, video submission. Um, short, well-defined applicant response. Um, written video or audio submission. Uh, I'm not sure if we said video here. Um, scoring panel. Uh, so the recommendation for a scoring panel size and composition uh, that includes four to six members uh, and at least two committee members, so PSEF um, committee members, and at least two staff and potential subject matter experts. Um, the committee member scoring panel participation um, so committee members participating in review take the same number or whether minimum or maximum of applicants based on reasonable and estimated time load. Uh, so I'll come back to this point. Uh, a minimum score will be established to pass technical review um, and minimum score established for equity criteria. So trying to make sure that there's an equity component in both the technical review or the minimum score um, criteria. Again, I think this is an area that uh, we wanna flesh out a little bit more. Um, but again, I think uh, making sure that equity is a component in the review process. Uh, and then the final bullet, portfolio balancing criteria. So ensuring that buckets are defined, that, that um, at least 20% of nonprofit organizations with a state admission and track record for programs that benefit economic disadvantaged community members, at least 50% clean energy projects benefit low income and communities of color, geographic balance, other strategies for funding you're identified in the RFP. So again, I think just uh, being um, reflective of what's um, in the code. Uh, some of these key components, I think um, we were trying to reflect um, some of the comments um, uh, from our pre previous meeting from committee members. Um, and I think, um, I think this is a, a great first um, step for us as a committee to begin uh, fleshing out what the RFP could look like for um, year one. Um, so I think, I don't know if there's anything else to add, Katie, but this I think is a moment for um, any feedback from uh, committee members. Um, yeah, so I mean, I, if I, I would just say that it's 846, so we have a, a pretty limited amount of um, time. We are gonna revisit this. Um, there is just one more slide, but it, um, and so maybe we can just, just kind of run through that slide and then take a few minutes to get initial kind of responses. We had thought before that we would have some time to kind of pause on this key decision points, but I just wanna make sure that, um, because it was because people it has been kind of coming up as a question a lot like what is a mini grant what is a small grant what is a large grant I have a hard time thinking about what this process might look like if I don't know what those things mean and so 
this is by no this is this slide is not a proposal sort of in the same way that the other slides contain proposals this slide is really just um, some ideas for the size um, the size definitions of those different categories and then the duration of those uh, of the sort of how long you would have to spend those funds um, I'd like to I think offer that maybe we can come back to this and and speak to it another time but just wanted to make sure that we had kind of at least touched on it since it was a question that came up so much at the, at the last meeting janet did you want to add something um, yeah just a reminder um as the mini grants the number of five thousand has some specific reasoning as far as like what we can and can't do um, through the bureau that set that up and the small and large just re as Katie noted like this is not a proposal but just starting to think through but the main thing as we think it through is keeping in mind the main differentiation is what's that level of um, detail that people need to give and documentation um, and in the application and the reporting um, is the thinking behind that. And it's something we would come back to, but just wanted to remind us how we came up with that. Yep. Michael? Uh, Janet, could you give me a little bit more, um, some little more concrete about the mini grant being $5,000 than the requirements of the city on that? Yeah, and any, yeah. Uh, Angela or Sam, you want to, did you just yeah. lean forward? Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, this city city procurement rules require any grant funds that are over five thousand dollars to go to city council. And so and so there's still some legal questions that we need to answer, but at a preliminary blush, that's sort of where we put that there because in terms of being able to be responsive and move quick, um, that could be the number. So it may change again as the process changes, but it's a sort of a starting place for that conversation, thinking around a mini grant being this responsive. Um, this responsive pool of resources, um, that's, that's one of the criteria is when we go to city council, it change, it, timelines change quite a bit and it, things become, things, it, it becomes much harder to be responsive. Thank you very much for that information. Yeah. Any other comments or questions? So I think that what I would like to do, since it is now time for committee member closing comments and us to kind of close out the meeting, is just ask, um, ask all of you to kind of think about between now and the me next meeting, if there are any um, kind of deal breakers or red flags that would um, keep you from making a proposal and approving a, the, a process kind of as we have described and in those the the process and just as a reminder is is really that that what is on slide 20 it's this review process proposal of these high these kind of high level categories Katie I think Brian, uh, yeah. change your mind okay um yeah so because the, with that, with that kind of green light from the full committee on a on a process, then the subcommittee and staff can kind of move forward with fleshing out a lot more of those details and bringing those to to you. Probably starting with that list of eligibility screening criteria that we brought to you last time and got a couple comments on. Is that an acceptable Katie. request? Yep. I. I should raise my hand apologies I, I, I think it's okay. a, I, I, what I want the one thing I wanted to flag and I think it's just worthwhile to explain in the last bit on the following slide um, and see the let me see because Ramfish you mentioned going at the next slide over um, this this fourth this fifth bullet um, I think that would be potentially worthwhile just to detail a little bit and explain because I, that, that certainly has implications as folks think about how they engage with this process and their availability and their time. So I think it's, it'd be helpful to explain that um, before we, we, we send folks off. Yeah, no, I appreciate you 
bringing us back to that, Sam. That um, that particular slide was was developed out of a conversation that was kind of in response to a comment that I believe Michael made at the last meeting about kind of what it means if we have um, some committee members who are able to uh, spend a, to put a lot more time towards scoring and other committee members who are not what that means in terms of like who has a, a bigger voice and what kinds of scorers and committee members have a bigger voice in that process. And so one of the things that we talked about was potentially limiting the um, sort of like offering the opportunity to all committee members to participate in a scoring panel and then kind of making a requirement that if you did say, yes, you could, you could participate, that um, you would be kind of either cap, everyone would get the same amount, and it would be amount that seemed reasonable, that people would be able to kind of get it done over the three or four week period on their off time, not have to take time off of work or not have to be in a profession that was very, very flexible, and they had a lot of, um, of sort of additional time to put to that. So that, so for example, say everyone who wanted to participate would get 10 applications to review. And we estimate that that would potentially take about 30 hours over three or four weeks. Um, another thing that we talked about was having kind of a, an, a, an upper and lower bound. So if there were some people who could take more, um, who could offer more time, we would allow them to do that to kind of help with the workload but not um, so much more. So maybe everybody takes 10, but then some people are able to take 15 or 17. So does that, are I there any comments on that thinking? Faith? I just wanted to ask Michael if that was responsive to his comment because- uh, Yes. Yeah. I didn't hear that last time, and I know that this, you know, when we met as a subcommittee, this was a bit of a confusing aspect for me. So I just really wanted to have Michael have a chance to flesh that out if that's in, in fact what he meant. And I don't remember actually making that <laughs> comment. But um, we have a recording, Michael. No. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> But um, no, I mean, I, 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 it sounds like something that I would, I would, uh, I would ask for clarification on. And I, I feel like that's fair. That if, that um, if there's, be, if there's folks that can do a little bit more, I just, I, my concern would still be that you know one that one group is doing eighty percent of the work and another group's doing twenty percent. Can I ask a follow up question on that? Oh, yeah. Uh, Michael, uh, I guess uh, um, it seems like the root issue here is making sure that we all, um, I guess it's just understanding what the workload is. Um, is that is that a fair question? Like, um, it seems like the, the ability to participate is what what is the workload and what the time um, duration is to to complete that workload. Um, right. And I don't think we know that yet. So um well I, and i think i'm not gonna i'm not, I'm not gonna be terribly worried about it until we finish our first round of funding and see how it looks um mm -hmm. see what our time commitments are um and see what staff's time commitments are um because yeah i guess i could see this taking Looking at the hours that we're going to be required from every staff member and every committee member to do this, you know, at 50 applications versus 100 applications versus 200, you know, it could get overwhelming real quick. Um, and I think you have put together something fantastic uh, with that um, sort of initial uh, yes, no, does it meet criteria, does it not? way to sort of flush some things out. Um, and uh, I don't know, it, it's, it's gonna be interesting. It's gonna be fun. Yes. Faith, did you 
has something to. I just, just uh, sorry for honing in on this, but I just want to make sure that I understand. Michael, um, I'm going to go back to you again. Is your it is a concern because I think what this is directed at is the concern is you have time to review only two applications, but Ramfis has time to review 12. Is that unfair to the applicant pool that your voice is only reflected on two of them and Ramfis is on 12 of them? Um, I think that we all know certain people in our communities. We all have certain communities that we kind of uh, are established in um, and we all like we all sort of balance each other out right um, I would I would worry a little bit if Ramfis was doing 12 and I was doing two um, I would worry a because Ramfis might be putting in way too much time into this uh, and I would also be worried that um, that if it is you know, two committee members that are doing the vast majority of them, then the, the voices of the rest of the committee, which is sort of representative of the communities that we are representing, um, won't be heard. Thanks, that's helpful for me. All right. So we have about two minutes for closing comments. I am going to make one of them, and that is to remind the people online that there, um, that there is a survey, a post-meeting survey available. Um, the link is on the last slide, and June is going to send it in the chat. Um, so just wanted to make that announcement and then switch to the last slide that has that link there. Um, are there any committee members or Sam, are you interested in kind of some final words in the last minutes here? All right, well, thank you all so much for hanging in there with us. And um, we'll be sending you a doodle poll and talking to you all again soon. Thank you. Night, y'all. Thank you. Okay. Night. Okay. Night. 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 Night, everybody. Good night. And it is officially nine o'clock, so I'm going to go ahead and end the meeting for everybody. All right, bye, sorry. Bye. I, <laughs>